Turn your Bibles to Matthew 26. Let's go. Matthew 26. All right. Well, we've been diving in, like I mentioned earlier, into Holy Week this week. Sunday was Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Uh, if you follow the story, especially through Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have very similar stories uh, when it comes to Holy Week. John puts things a little bit differently, but it still also has uh, th this triumphal entry, uh, these kinds of things. So Monday was the cleansing of the, of the temple. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one, if you've not read that passage before, you've got to read it, because it blew my mind. I remember growing up, and I grew up in a Christian home, uh, but the only kind of Christians that I remember, now I'm in my 40s now, so I've lost some of my memory, okay? <laughs> what I remember specifically was hypocrites. Ooh. Maybe you can relate. Because I remember going to church... And you know, mom and grandma, they take you to church. You know what I'm saying? It's mom and grandma. It's never dad. Which is ridiculous. But uh, we're trying to change that in this church. Amen? Hey. Hey. Amen. But I would go, and my dad would be there, kind of standing there. And I remember he had this brown jacket. I think he still has it. Uh -huh. uh, but he had this brown jacket he would wear. And he'd kind of dress up, you know, but he would... Be singing, you know, be singing a song, and you could just watch barely his lips move, you know what I mean? Just barely. And if you listen very carefully, you hear like... <laughs> Not that he was like trying to sing the song, he was singing the song. My dad's actually got a pretty decent voice. Okay. Right? But, but and, and then, after church, like, he'd make a beeline for the doors. And you would think, he'd be like, oh, we gotta go, he's gotta go to work. No, he had to go out there to smoke cigarettes with the other dads. Whoa. Oh, so you're no. leaving church and out the doors, it's like you're opening the doors and you're headed into like a club or something, you know, with a bunch of smoke oh, oh, no. And I'm like, that that can't be right. That, that, even at like six, eight years old, I'm going, there's something wrong with this picture. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then I got older and I started going to a, a, a Christian school and, you know, we started going to the church that was associated with that Christian school. And all the guys that were around me were, like, weird. Mm. Now, Christians get the, you know, the charge of being weird anyway. And on some level, we are. We're weird. We're fools for Christ. It's just the way that it is. But the reality is, like, this was a different kind of weird, right? So I like to use, and, and I, don't, I don't know the common vernacular for this. Uh, maybe there's a new television show that's got somebody like this that you can help me out with for the younger generation, okay? But, like, I I'm familiar with The Simpsons. And there's The Simpsons had a next-door neighbor whose name was Ned Flanders, right? Just Google it if you don't know who I'm talking about. It's this Christian dude, highly only good neighbor, just, like, weird, just a weirdo. <laughs> like you, you look at you look at what like godly masculinity should be, and you're like, this ain't it. Uh -huh. And then I would read passages in the scriptures about Jesus, and I'd go, he's not a hypocrite smoking cigarettes after church, and he's not Ned Flanders either. Yeah, come on, bro. Especially when we talk about him cleansing the temple, literally a premeditated act of aggression. Mm. Wow. From Love incarnate. Wow. And one of these days we'll preach a lesson on it because there's some really striking things that he does in that where he turns over the money changers' tables and he whips the, uh, the animals to go on a stampede, but, but he's got these doves and pigeons that are in cages. And instead of in his oh, like uncontrollable anger, which he didn't have, he was totally under control, he said, get these out of here. So this wasn't Jesus on an angry tirade, like just a fit of rage. This is anger under control. And what does he say? A zeal for my house will consume you. That's what happened on Monday. On Tuesday, the Jews try to trap him again, one last time. They try to get out to Adam and try to come. And after that, they're just like, we can't do this anymore. 
And so it is at that point that we get to Spy Wednesday, or what we call Silent Wednesday, which is where we see Judas betraying Jesus. There's a lot of things that are going on in the background. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. Turn your Bibles, if you haven't been already there, Matthew 26, and let's just read the scene. Come on, Come on Starting here in verse 1. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priest and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head, and as he was reclining at the table, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume should have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This is really the calm before the storm. All these things. You've got, the, you've got Judas that's secretly scheming for an opportunity. You've got the religious leaders that are, that are scheming for this opportunity. And, oh, it's a match made in hell. Wow. wow. Because the Jewish leaders haven't been able to figure out a way to trap them yet. Mm. Mm. They haven't been able to figure out, okay, well, let's, you know, let's do it this time. Right. What's crazy is that this isn't just the only time that they've tried to kill Jesus. Mm. Right. In fact, you can go all the way back to Mark chapter 3, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. They're trying to kill him. Mm. From the beginning. And we think that us as Christians are going to have it easy. Right. Right. Come on, bro. But now there was their chance with Judas. You know, much like Jezebel in the Old Testament, nobody names their kid Judas. Right. Like that name, like Jezebel, is like infamous for like, no, you don't touch that name. Right. I've met one Jezebel in my life. And luckily, she was nothing like the Jezebel of the, of the Bible. But still, her parents had to have like a secret hate for her wow. to name her that. Oh, or they just had like, ne like zero, zero clue as to what, hey, I think that name's kind of cool. Like, do you really, you know, know what that is? <laughs> but here what's crazy is that all references in the Gospels to Judas, the writers are very clear to mention him last in the list, and also very clear to have a caveat of the one who betrayed Jesus. Yeah. The yeah. one who betrayed him. Yeah. Even in the book of Acts, there was a couple different Judases. I mean, just think about that. Like, you had to follow the Judas. It, it, but they, there was always clarifying. Judas, also known as Justice, or, you know, something like that. You know, it's like, hey, hey, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> this shadow around Judas carried on. Even, obviously, to this day, we're talking about it now, but 400 years after these happenings that we're just reading about in Matthew 26, some relatives, some family members, you know, 400 years later, there was a book that surfaced called the Book of Judas or the Gospel of Judas. Many, some, maybe some of you have read it or have heard about it. And it was written specifically for an angle of making Judas seem better than he actually was in all four Gospels. Wow. And it was the angle of, hey, Judas is doing this because Jesus told him to. Like, that somehow it was, it was, it was a secret plan between Jesus and Judas. Wow. Uh -huh. Come on, bro. Wow. So, obviously it coming 400 years after, and no historical evidence prior to that of 
this narrative being any different than what it is in its original form obviously throws not even just doubt, but complete and utter like ridiculousness at the book of Judas or the gospel of Judas. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be betrayed? Just think about that. I think all of us have been betrayed at one point or another in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to be betrayed over you know, a failed business deal. It's another thing to be betrayed when a close relationship comes in a betrayal over a conflict of some kind. It's a whole nother thing to have someone who is loyal to you, who you have trusted to betray you. Some of us know exactly how that feels. Some of us have been on the giving end of these kinds of betrayals. And many of us have been on the receiving end. While today in this passage, we're reminded of the ultimate betrayal that Jesus suffered, which ultimately was necessary for our salvation. In this sermon, we'll explore the significance of this ultimate betrayal and how it points us towards the love and mercy of God. The title of our lesson tonight is The Ultimate Betrayal. I have three points for us tonight. Wow, First one on. is the betrayal was predicted by prophecy. Look here, Matthew 26, look here at verse 2. As you know, Jesus is saying this. He says, when he finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So Jesus is predicting what's going to happen in just a couple days. This was not the first time that Jesus had predicted his betrayal and death. In fact, he was talking about it for much of the last Three years that he was in ministry. We could go all the way back to the first time he was predicted his death in detail in Matthew 16. Jesus had just fed the multitudes. And he said to the disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed, and then be raised again. Peter then, rashly, if you remember the story, pulls Jesus aside and says, this is never going to happen to you, Jesus, and rebukes Jesus. Mm. And Peter, being the one that puts his foot in his mouth on a regular basis, yes, Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan. Oh, yeah. Again, a chapter later, Jesus predicts his death a second time in Matthew 17. This occurs shortly after the transfiguration where Peter, James, and John go up on the mountain with Jesus and he's transformed into his heavenly body, talks with Moses and Elisha there. They have a good conversation. Perhaps this was the reason why the disciples were confused by Jesus telling them he was going to die. Like, wait a second, we just saw you up there transfigured. You're, you're the son of God for crying out loud. That's not going to happen. But despite their lack of understanding, the Bible says that they were afraid to ask for clarification. Later in Matthew 20, describes the third time Jesus predicted his death. And this one he spoke to his disciples as they were heading up towards Jerusalem for another Passover, so last year's Passover. And he told them how he would be mocked, scourged, crucified, and then rise again. And on this occasion, also the disciples were like, what? This doesn't make any sense. Who's he talking about? But again, they didn't ask. Right? They would soon learn from Jesus what that, those events meant. But there's another striking prophecy that Jesus gives that's very subtle here in chapter 26. And we read about it starting here in verse 6. It says, While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world... What she has done will also be told in memory for her. And this is a prophecy of what's happening right now today. We're telling of this story. I'm preaching. Wow. Wow. 
Here in Matthew 26, we have another prediction, but again, like I said, it's slightly subtle. For instance, when Mary anointed Jesus with this costly perfume, John's version of the story, Judas is the one who makes this comment. Not the disciples. Matthew's a little bit more open, kind of sharing the blame a little bit, you know? Maybe there was having some conversation, but Judas was the one that's like, this is disgusting. But Jesus says, leave her alone. She says, she's anointing me for my burial. Your burial? Mm -hmm. You're 33 years old, man. You're just you're in your prime. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, what do you mean you're going to die? This doesn't make any sense. Mm. Again, while not an explicit prediction, like the previous ones, this is clearly pointing to Jesus' death and burial. Mm. Jesus intentionally came to earth to die for our sins. Jesus says in John 14, 29, Jesus tells his disciples the reason why he's giving them these warnings and these predictions. He says, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I mean, think about it. Your Savior, your Rabbi, your Lord, is going to be brutally murdered, and he's telling you ahead of time, and yet you're still shocked. And we know later on, because we have the, the insight into the rest of the story, that we can know what happened. Right? They didn't have that. They're living this real time. Wow. And so he's making sure to let them know, hey guys, this is going to happen. So just be aware. But this is also prophesied about in the Old Testament. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Come on, bro. Isaiah 53, look here in verse 3. The Bible says, He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. What does this mean? It means that he was despised and rejected. Pretty self-explanatory. We can see that Isaiah was prophesying about him very early on that this is what was going to happen. He was going to be rejected. He was going to be pushed away. He was going to be betrayed. The betrayal of Jesus was not a surprise to him. He was very clear on him playing his part in God's grand plan of redemption for you and I. But while this is true, the, 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 the betrayal was still a choice. Mm. Judas didn't have to betray him. Yeah. Judas made a choice. Which is my second point, the betrayal was a choice. Judas did not have to give in to the temptation to conspire against Jesus. He didn't have to give in to the temptation to be greedy. Mm -hmm. As that passage, in a parallel passage in John, says that he really didn't say that, hey, we should have sold this and given it to the poor because he cared about the poor, but because he was the treasurer of the group and helped himself to what was in the treasury. Mm -hmm. And that alabaster jar was worth fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in today's money. Think about how much he could help himself to that money. The betrayal was a choice. Matthew twenty-six, verse fourteen says, "Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you?'" So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on. Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Judas Iscariot made a conscious decision to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And oddly enough, if you go back into the Mosaic Law, that's exactly the amount of money a slave was worth. Wow. He was not forced to do it, but he chose to betray his master. We get a glimpse into Judas' heart towards Jesus later in Matthew 26. Look here in verse 20. Wow. 
It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now, you got twelve dudes with Jesus, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. Like, it's very difficult to, like, go, oh, like, who's somebody out here? <laughs> I'd be looking at like, okay, Jay. Uh, <laughs> Skyler? Or is it? it can't be Mike. <laughs> no, it, it, it's got to be, it's got to be Ethan. Oh. Wow. He looks a little shifty wow. today, you know what I mean? We were going to... I mean, think about the scene. Jesus is just laying it out. Hey, one of you is going to betray me. Wow. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Mm. He supplied, the one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. Oh. Meaning, somebody here who's been eating the very food that we've been eating mm. is going to betray me. All right, who, who, I'd be like, not me then. It was a napkin. You know? I, I, I didn't have, I, he had a double portion. I gave him a portion. Uh, the one who has dipped... His hand in the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Mm. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't need me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, oh, wow. You have said so. Now what's crazy is if you keep reading this and you read the other accounts, none of the other disciples got it. Mm. Like you would think they'd be like, Oh, he just called out Judas. We're going to... Hog tie him, we're gonna like duct tape him to a, pet, a pole or something. Like, we're gonna make sure he doesn't do anything. <laughs> There's like, like they just ignore it. It doesn't make any sense. But I want you to notice the language in the passage here. The other 11 disciples respond to Jesus' statement that a betrayer is among them with, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. <laughs> Now, they were far from perfect, just like you and me, broken people in need of Jesus. But Jesus had conquered their hearts. He was their Lord. Mm. Judas responded very differently and says, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Right. Wow. Yeah. To Judas, Jesus was a teacher that he respected. Mm. Mm. No different than the Jewish leaders. Yeah. No different than Muslims today. <laughs> They believe in Jesus, that Jesus was just a rabbi, just a cool teacher. A great model, an example he learned from. But Jesus was not Lord of his life. Judas never surrendered his will to Jesus. Judas was informed, but never transformed. Let me tell you something. If you have not been transformed by Jesus... He's a cool teacher. Maybe you've read some cool scripture. You've gone to church a couple times, but he's not your Lord wow. because your life isn't any different. Wow. wow. Come on, bro. That was me growing up. Wow. Again, grew up in church. No big deal. Like, mm. I could quote scripture. I remember one Christmas. Some of y'all have heard this story before. One Christmas, I was talking to my, my mom and dad about this uh, when I went up there the, uh, a couple, a few weeks ago for, well, a few months ago now. Uh, to visit. And I'm like, hey, remember this situation that's happened? Like, I want to find this. But I, I, I got this idea on Christmas Eve. I wanted to go through every single one of the Gospels that had a Christmas story. I want to put it all in chronological order. Some of them have, you know, certain instances that others don't, right? I wanted to, and I put it all together. I was going to read it at Christmas dinner with my family. I chickened out. I chickened out. But I grew up in church. And I remember that I got baptized at 13 years old. Why? Because my, we went to church camp, and my brother got baptized in a lake. And I remember when my sister got baptized, I'm like, okay, well, baptism, we got to do it, I guess. So my brother did it at the lake. I don't want to do it at the lake. I want my dad to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we went, and I put on this blue robe, and, uh, you know, the, when I got in the water, it just kept on creeping up. It just was, like, weird. You know what I mean? It was, like, a big dress or whatever. And I went in the water, came back up. I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I got into more trouble more sin, I did more diabolical and despicable things from 13 to 20 than I ever did the first 13 years of my life. Oh, wow. wow. I grew up hearing about Jesus. I was well informed. I could tell you 
died for my sins, rose on the third day. I could tell you stories. I could, the whole nine yards. But it never changed my life. Mm, wow. It never changed the way that I lived. And you know what? For that very reason, Jesus was nothing more than a rabbi to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Just a good teacher. He personally saw Jesus confront the religious, forgive sinners, perform miracles. He heard every sermon that Jesus preached. Judas saw Jesus put sight into the eyes of blind men. Tell paralyzed people to pick up their mats and walk. Raise children from the dead. Heal leopards and cast out demons. He saw firsthand the very power of God perfectly displayed in Jesus. Wow. wow. He knew a whole lot about Christ, but Jesus did not personally know Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Judas even had the ability to drive out demons and to perform miracles. Judas learned from Jesus' teachings, but never allowed the teachings to transform him. Mm -hmm. And Jesus would not be Judas's savior because he was not Judas's Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, a famous Christian writer, A.W. Tozer, wrote this, The Lord will not save those whom he cannot command. Oh. He will not divide his offices. You cannot believe on a half-Christ. We take him for what he is, the anointed Savior and Lord. He would not be who he is if he saved us without the understanding that he can also guide and control our lives. Mm. Hey, now, you had me up to the point you said control. Uh -oh. What, are you guys a cult? You talking about Jesus controlling you? Jesus doesn't control you. Mm. If he's your Lord, he does. Mm. Does the President of the United States control your life? Mm. No. Does your teacher control your life? No. Do the cops control your life? Yeah. Do the laws of this land control your life? Yes. Mm. To the degree that you obey them. Mm. The Bible says that we are no longer as Christians, as disciples, we're no longer under the control of this world, we're under the control of righteousness. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every one of us is controlled by something in this room. Every one of us is controlled by somebody in this room. You just got to choose who it is. Mm. It's either Satan or it's Jesus. Mm. Not many Come on, it's pretty bro. obvious who is the Lord of his life. Is Jesus merely your rabbi? Wow. The one who we look to for advice and counsel in how we live our lives. When, when things are going bad, I just... I just you know, I flip open my Bible, I go to the Psalms because, you know, <laughs> the Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own lands. Foreigners will join them. Oh, that sounds so awesome. Nation will take them and bring them into their own place. Oh, that sounds, that just soothes my soul. <laughs> now, to be sure, the Bible's supposed to do that. Psalms in particular are wonderful ways to soothe your soul. But if that's your only encounter with Jesus then he's not your Lord, he's just a rabbi. Mm -hmm. This is no better than any other cool, kind of sweet little book that you pick up to like get a little couple nuggets out of it. Mm -hmm. right. Come on. Is Jesus our Lord, or is he our rabbi? Mm -hmm. If he's your Lord, then he's the one who rules and reigns in your hearts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He dictates the way that you live your life. The difference is monumental. Wow. Mm -hmm. You either a disciple or a betrayer. This is a choice for all of us tonight. We can choose to follow Jesus and be loyal to him, or we can betray him by following our own desires and sin. But here's the crazy thing. All of us have already made the choice. Mm. It's not a choice that you're making today. I'm not asking you to make the choice today. You've already made the choice. Yeah. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned. Mm -hmm. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The reality of our lives is that we have all chosen sin. I haven't chosen sin. Okay, have you lied before? Then you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Oh, yeah, but yeah, but, you know, it wasn't really a pig lie. Was it a lie? Right. Mm. Right. Oh, it's just a white lie. You still have the word lie. You keep saying the word lie, so it's, it's still a lie. Right. <laughs> Come on, bro. You stole a pack of bubble gum when you were five. <laughs> yeah. You didn't obey your mother and father at least once. Mm. That's all of us right there. Forget it. We're done. Right. Mm. Right. We've all chosen sin. All of us have betrayed Jesus. And as Romans 6, 23 says, we all are worthy of death. The Bible says the wages of sin. What are wages? Things you work for. What we work for with our sin is death. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We deserve to die mm. for our betrayal of Jesus, not Jesus. But because we still live, many of us kind of have maybe a couple different focuses. Well, because I haven't, there aren't any consequences for my sin then I guess that means God accepts it. Mm. Uh -oh. I'm okay. And what has the religious world told us? God loves you just the way you are. Mm -hmm. You don't got to change. You got to come as you are. Oh, and to be sure, coming to Jesus, yeah, he does love you the way that you are. He just doesn't expect you to stay that way. There you yeah. Go. Mm -hmm. Come tomorrow. on, bro. Yeah. Great. He expects change. Right. Yeah. Right. But our religious society says, hey, just believe. All you got to do is have faith in Jesus. The Bible says in James that even the demons believe. Does that mean they're going to heaven? No, they're demons for crying out loud. That logic doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. The demons have more faith in Jesus than we do. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So we are on the one side going, well, okay, there's no consequence, so that means must that must mean that I'm accepted, so I'm fine, everything's cool. Or on the other side, it means that I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing because there isn't any consequence. Mm. Well, I, both of these answers are terribly wrong. But here's the good news. Come on, mm, come on bro. There's good news that can come from betrayal. Right? We've all heard the coffee cup scripture, Matthew 8, 28, right? It talks about all God works all things for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. God can take something like the ultimate betrayal <coughs> and he can turn it into something good. Because the betrayal is a reminder of God's love and mercy. That's our third point. Mm -hmm. The betrayal is a reminder of God's love and mercy. You know, despite the betrayal of Judas and the rejection of Jesus by the Jewish leaders, God's love and mercy are still at work. Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and through his sacrifice, we have been reconciled to God if we choose to be reconciled to God. Mm -hmm. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look here in verse 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. <coughs> Let God demonstrate. Here. Romans 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners. Notice the word mm. still. Mm. Still sinners. Christ died for us. Yeah. Now, what comes after this does not apply to everybody in this room. It applies for those that it applies. Mm. It says, since we have now been justified by his blood. Not all of us have been justified by his blood. Since now we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Yeah. That means his resurrected life. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Yeah. Romans 5.8. God demonstrated his love for us that while we still betrayed him, while we still betray him on a daily basis, Christ died for us. 
The ultimate betrayal of Jesus was a reminder of God's great love and mercy towards you and I. Even though we, like Judas and the other apostles who deserted Jesus just shortly thereafter, in a time of great need, betrayed him, there's good news. Go back to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Look here in verse 4. Again, a prophecy about what was going to happen to Jesus just a few days later. It says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. What is he saying? He took up the pain. He took up our suffering. He took on our sin. Mm -hmm. We were like, ah, it's his sin. See, God is punishing him for his rebellion. God's punishing him for his blasphemy. But he was pierced for our transgressions, which is another word for sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. Again, another word for sins. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Each one of us has rejected God's will for our life. Whether you would believe it or not, you have. And Jesus has paid the price for that rejection. Jesus has paid the price for that rebellion. Jesus has paid the price for that betrayal. Jesus, in his love for you and I, decided, he made the conscious choice to go to the cross. In fact, if you read a little bit further on in Matthew 26, where he's at the Garden of Gethsemane, contrary to popular belief, Jesus was not fired up to go to the cross. Right. He wasn't just like skipping along going, all right, nails and beat down and whips. This is good. I love it. This is awesome. He's not like David Goggins, who was like running around going, pain, baby, pain, this is good. Mm. That's not his game. He had to choose to go to the cross, and he did. Mm -hmm. To bring us back to God. Amen. That was his part of the divine equation. Now, it's our turn to respond. Yeah. Final point for tonight, the betrayal is a call to action. The betrayal is a call to action. Joshua 24, verse 15 reminds us, Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. We are called to follow Jesus and to be faithful to him, even in the face of persecution and rejection. We are also called to share the love and mercy of God with others so that they too can come to know him. Go to Luke chapter 9. Come on. Luke chapter 9. Go on, Luke. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, was in the garden fighting to have the right heart to go, God, I don't want to do this. And he says these words, he says, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus actually, I love, I love Jesus because as a follower of Jesus, Jesus is never going to ask us to do something that he himself did not do. There is not one single command of Jesus that he did not live out and exemplify before he calls us to do it. Mm. And Luke 9, 23 is no exception. He says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. What does it mean to be a disciple? A disciple is a student, is a learner, is a follower of Jesus. Mm, yeah. You know, nowhere in the Bible did Jesus say, Go and make Christians. Go and make believers. You will not find it. You will not find a word where Jesus says, the ultimate result of following me is to just believe or to be. He 
says, disciple. Yeah. Mm. And this is one of the passages that Jesus uses to explain this truth to those who would follow him. Right. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, you should deny yourself, he says. No. Is that what he said? No. It would probably be a good idea. I mean, you'd be a hardcore Christian if you did. No. But you don't really have to because, you know, if you just believe, you're okay. No, no he says they must deny themselves. And notice he says, whoever wants to. This is like the cover charge to get into discipleship. It's not even that you actually are. It's like if you desire this, then you better start denying yourself and taking up your cross. Mm. Mm. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. We are called to change our lives, and instead of living for ourselves, we live for Jesus and his purpose. For our lives. Mm. Jesus says that we are, if we are to be his followers, we must deny ourselves. This means doing what he wants us to do, especially when our heart's desire is to do the opposite. You know, when we want to do what Jesus wants us to do, that's easy. That's totally easy. That's like Jesus wants me to have some ice cream. No problem. Deny myself every day. Every day. I like that, Jesus. But what if he tells me, hey, you're living in sin, and you need to change some things in your life to align yourself with my will for your life. Mm. Oh, but I don't want to change that. Uh -huh. That will make people feel a certain way about me. Ooh. That, that, that confronts the reality of, wow, I'm going to have to tell this person that I can't be with them. I, I'm going to have to... Well, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to talk to my family and and and, and share the gospel. I, I'm, that intimidates me. Come on, bro. I don't want to give up that sin. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, you pick your poison. Mm. He says that if we're going to have, if we're going to be our followers, we must deny ourselves. Yeah. And he goes on to tell us that we have to take up our cross. We have to take up our cross daily. He says. What did Jesus do on the cross? He suffered and he died. So we're going to have to suffer and die daily. Wow, that doesn't sound like Christianity today. Wow. Go to any church out here. Are they suffering and dying? No. No. Wow. No. The church I grew up in, there was nobody suffering and dying. Maybe some of those dads that are out there smoking, now they're suffering and dying. Oh, oh my God. It's our call. It's your choice. Jesus loves us enough to give us the choice. to He can be a rabbi or he can be Lord. Again, our sins deserve death. The least we can do is choose to die to ourselves daily and live for him. Saving our lives will end us losing it when our number is called. But notice he says not just losing your life in general. Because many of us, we go to the gym, we choose to eat healthy, we choose to go to work, we discipline our finances, we're this, we're this, we're denying ourselves. I see. Mm. But are we doing so for him? Or are we doing so for ourselves? Notice it's not for our own benefit, although there are plenty of benefits to being a disciple of Jesus, but for his benefits. That is what will get us saved. But what if does him being ashamed what is all that about? That doesn't make any sense. Well, go to Matthew 10. Jesus is going to get a little bit more specific in Matthew chapter 10. You know, I, when I became a disciple, my big dream was to own a bicycle shop. I was a mountain bike racer in Alaska. Uh, I loved bicycles. It was just my jam. Uh, still is, but they're really expensive now. Uh, a really nice bike. It's really expensive down there. But uh, so I got a job at Jack's Bicycle Center down in Long Beach. And there was this guy at Jack's who claimed to be a Christian. He was, uh, I, I was going to Long Beach City at the time. And he was on Long Beach City too. And he led a campus ministry there. 
And yet, what was crazy, and I, I, I was kind of, I wasn't incognito. The people around me knew that I was a Christian, but I didn't tell him. Like, I didn't directly go, hey, man, we're, you know. Uh, because the way that he acted was just like everybody else at that shop. I mean, he cursed with the other mechanics in the back. He catcalled and spoke about women that would come in to uh, buy bicycles or buy things like this. And... And I tolerated it for a while until I just couldn't stand it anymore. Like, I'm like, okay, well, we all have bad days. You know what I mean? Like, hey, man, maybe he's just, you know, and I was a young Christian at the time, so I didn't want to, like, start a fight or anything. You know what I mean? But I confronted him. And he informed me that he was a Christian, and they appreciated me calling him out. I was like, oh, okay, well, this went really well. <laughs> and yet he never changed a Wow. And in fact, when he would see me on campus, he started persecuting me. Wow. It was insane. Wow. wow. Now, again, we all struggle with worldliness from time to time. We're in the world. We're not of the world. But there are going to be times where we have to fight that. That's why the Bible says, Jesus tells us to deny ourselves. Right. Because yeah. there will be times where we have to deny ourselves. Yeah, come on, bro. But he was nowhere near a Christian. Mm. Nowhere near it. See, so here's the thing that he's saying here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, he says, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Mm. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, the religious world will look at this and go, yeah, if you deny Jesus, but does your life deny Jesus? If somebody wanted to follow Jesus and they looked at your life and they knew you were a Christian, would they look like I did most of my uh, life and go, he acts just like me. Like, what's the difference? Mm. If he's going to be, if he calls himself a Christian, I mean, I'm actually a little bit better than him. I'm not doing this and this and this. We're not defining Christianity for ourselves. Jesus gets to define Christianity. Yeah. Your pastor doesn't get to define Christianity. Yeah. Your mom doesn't get to define Christianity. Your yeah. school doesn't get to define... Society yeah. doesn't define yeah. Christianity. On, Jesus defines what it means to be a follower. Yeah. 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 He says, if you, den if you disown me, mm. if you deny me, if you do not acknowledge me before men, whether with your life or your mouth, and preferably both, right. wow. then I will not acknowledge you when Jesus comes back. Wow. 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 If we're not willing to show ourselves to be true followers of Jesus, we're telling Jesus that we are ashamed of him. There's no such thing as a closet Christian. Mm. No. If we live lives that are ashamed of Jesus, afraid to identify with him, not just when it suits our needs, but especially to our own detriment, there's no greater time where Jesus smiles on us in those times. It's true that Jesus chose the cross in spite of all rebellion, in spite of our betrayal, but that does not leave us without obligation to respond. So what does Jesus require of us? To actually have him be our Lord. Yeah. yeah. To actually repent, to turn to God so the times of refreshing may come from Jesus, mm -hmm. as Acts 3.19 says. This is not just a single moment in time, although it begins with a single moment in time. But it's a choice to live the remainder of our lives for him and not for ourselves. Instead of death, we get life, and all that we have to do is live for him. What a deal. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What a deal. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Tonight, if you are a disciple of Jesus in this room tonight, who's been forgiven but you have forgotten what Jesus went through for you, make the decision to act and be moved by the grace that you have been given so you do not continue to receive God's grace in vain. Mm. For those who have not experienced God's saving grace, but are under God's common grace, if you want to know the difference, one sends you to heaven, one just allows you to breathe right now. Mm. Wow. wow. Choose to study the Bible and learn what it means to truly receive God's grace mm. and forgiveness for your betrayal. Learn what it looks like to repent and live the life that is of a true disciple of Jesus. 
The betrayal of Jesus was a significant event in the history of our salvation. Without it, we would not be here, and there'd be no point for us to be here. Mm. It was predicted by prophecy. It was a choice, both yours, mine, and Judas's. It was a reminder of God's love and mercy, and it calls us to take action. As we reflect on this passage, let's remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us, and let us choose to follow him faithfully. I love you all very, very much. Come on.